Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for how far you have led us. And we thank you for the study we have in your word now. Our hearts desire and prayer is that you help every one of us to be like you. We pray, O oh Lord, that the mind of Christ, the life of Christ, everything that Christ has died to purchase for us, you help us to have, to possess, to manifest in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that these words in the chapter we're going to look at today will be written upon our hearts so that every day of our lives will manifest the mind and the life of Christ. Help us, Lord, open our eyes to see, our hearts to believe, and a faith to possess. Grant unto us. In Jesus' name we pray. Today we come to the study of Philippians chapter 2. I brought uh, the study of chapter 1 to you yesterday. And today as we look at chapter 2, the real verse that sums up everything is found in chapter 2 and in verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus. He lifts up Jesus Christ for us to see, lifts him up for us to believe, believe in him, to worship, to exalt, for us to follow him, for us to serve him. But it's not just lifting up Jesus Christ for us to see so we can bear his name. Is calling us to a kind of conformity, wanting us to be conformed unto Him in mind, conformed in motive, conformed in love, conformed in humility, in life, and in service, so that we'll have the same servant attitude with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, Let this mind be in you. Let it be in you now. Let it be in you always. Let it be in you at all times. He wants us to be so conformed to him that we will manifest the servant attitude of Christ in all things and at all times that will literally walk in the steps of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our relationship to God, our obedience to God, our love for him, our service to one another, and our attitude to self and denial of self, all these things are to be patterned after his own. And so he says, whatever you do, whatever you profess, whenever it is, whatever circumstance in which you may find yourself, whatever time or period, and whatever generation you may be living in, if you profess to know Christ, if you profess to be in Christ, if you profess that you fully and truly belong to him, there is something that will mark you out. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now you will find that this is not peculiar at all to Philippians chapter 2. It's the call of the whole scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ himself had called us that will be conformed unto him. We will watch him, study him, and do what he did. And then we will practice everything the way he did it. And also the epistles uh, tell us the same thing. Let's go back now to Matthew and find out about this conformity to Christ and see what the whole of the New Testament, the New Covenant, is telling us as to the life we are to live, the behavior we are to uh, manifest, and the things that we are to do in relationship to that of Christ. In Matthew chapter 11 verse 29, the words of Jesus Christ himself to his own, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. 
fire me can lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your soul you'll never really find complete rest complete satisfaction until you look at christ you take his controlling yoke upon you and then you learn of him so that you will be as he is in john chapter 13 just before he surrendered himself for he was taken by wicked hands to be crucified in that passion week that last week of his earthly ministry he got his disciples together and then he began to do the work of his slave of his servant washing their feet when he finished he called them to this thing that we're talking about in john chapter 13 verse 15 for i have given you an example that ye should do as i have done to you he had demonstrated this humility in a practical way and after doing that he said i have given you an example it's not just that i've done this and it's to be ended there this is an example for you that you will do as i have done unto you i am your master i'm your lord and so it is and you know how great i am he must have been saying to them and he should have understood that and how low you are in comparison with me but you see what i've done stooping down condescending and washing your feet you ought to do that one to another and in verse 17 if you know these things happier ye if you do them john chapter 15 verse 12 this is my commandment that ye love one another as i have loved you he is a reference point he is the one that is a perfect example and a pattern he said you see the love i've shown to you you must love one another as i have loved you have you seen three different times when christ himself called all the disciples and in all that he's calling you and calling me that we should follow after the pattern he has laid down for us and now in ephesians chapter 5 ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 walk in love as christ also has loved us and given and he has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to god for a sweet smelling savor again the comparison is made between christ and the christian the comparison is made between the master and the disciples and it says we're to walk in love and it shows us the level of that love the height of that love it says as christ also has loved you that's in ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 husbands love your wives once again he wants to show us the pattern how to love our wives even as christ also has loved the church and it wasn't just um, love in the mental understanding it says it's not just the feeling he gave himself for it for the church and in that same way you are to manifest love in colossians chapter 2 colossians chapter 2 verse 6 as ye have therefore received christ jesus the lord so walk ye in him as you have received christ jesus the lord he is the model he is the pattern he is a perfect example so walk ye in him first peter chapter 2 verse 21 for even hereunto were ye called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example look at his life his prayer life look at his life his life of humility and service look at his life his life of submission to the father to the will of the father look at his life his life for fulfilling the scripture because he will do something and then they will say in this the scripture has been fulfilled look at everything he did and then it says he has left us an example that we should follow his steps in first john chapter 2 and in verse 6 he that says he abideth in him ought himself so to walk even as he walked 
you ought to walk even as Christ walked. In Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, from verse 29. Again, we're told here of the necessity and the importance of being conformed unto his image. Verse 29, Romans chapter 8. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. It's clear then in the New Testament that all those who are born again, all those who are children of God, are called to a life of following after Christ, patterning everything after the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Conformity to Christ then is the purpose and the goal of all Christian experiences. Whatever Christian experience we have is to lead us more and more to being conformed unto Christ from the point of conversion. You begin to consecrate yourself so that Lord you help me to be more like my Lord and my master. That will be your prayer. And when you get into sanctification, that's what you're still looking for. And when you become filled with the Holy Ghost, and then in your daily fellowship with the Lord, all these things will only have meaning and significance when and only when these things help you to be more and more conformed unto Christ. And that's what we're going to learn in this chapter. The chapter is talking about submission to one another. And Christ is the example. And the chapter is talking about supreme self-humiliation of our Lord Jesus Christ and Savior. And it's lifted up like that so that you will see the measure of his humiliation as well as humility. And then you'll be able to follow that example. There is a challenge that we shall shine as lights in a world of darkness. Again, Christ is the perfect example for that. And there is a sacrificial service of a servant of the Lord. All these things are reaching to stir us up. So we'll serve the Lord and we'll serve his church and even minister to the world. There are four points we're going to consider in the chapter. Number one self-sacrifice and submission of christians the self-sacrifice and submission of christians verses one to four number two the supreme self-emptying of christ he emptied himself of his glory self-emptying of christ supreme self-emptying of christ verses five to eleven number three Shining saints in a crooked community. Shining saints in a crooked community. Verses 12 to 24. And then number four, the sacrificial service of a Christian companion. The sacrificial service of a Christian companion. Now we come to uh, point number one. The self-sacrifice and submission of Christians. Let's look at it now from chapter 2, verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of this of one accord of one mind let nothing be done through strife or being glory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves look not every man on his own things and but every man also on the things of others the verses we're reading are so full and they are so pregnant with meaning that uh, it will really take the Spirit of God for you to understand fully what the Lord is saying here. But here we have principles for living that will make us to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But we must not overlook that transitional word there, 
therefore. When you see a therefore, you will know that it's a word that links the preceding verses with the uh, other verses that come after. The word therefore uh, in that verse 1, we refer to that as a transitional word. That means he had said something and he said because of what I said before, on the basis of the things we've been saying, this is now what to consider. What had he said? He had said in the closing verses of chapter 1, only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. That's in verse 27. That whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. He was uh, telling the people, he said, Do you know what we have said before? That you will live a holy life. You will live a righteous life. You will walk worthy of the gospel. You will be of one mind. You will be of the same spirit. Therefore, then you move on to chapter 2. He has said you'll be striving together for the faith of the gospel. And then in verse 28, verse 29, you will not be terrified by anything your adversaries or persecutors may say or do. Now that you have an attitude of confidence in the Lord and you are not terrified about anything anybody does or says, therefore, then you go on to uh, chapter 2. It says, do you know that we are being called not only to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but to suffer for his sake? Therefore, because we are called to suffer with him and be totally identified with him, therefore, on the basis of all this, you will go on to chapter 2. Read that now. Chapter 2 again, verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, that is, if there, therefore, with all those things that we have said, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there is any comfort of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if there be bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy. It's bringing another thing here, something they had not introduced in chapter 1. It said, is there any consolation in Christ at all? It's like asking them a question and answering the question. Because you see, when it said, if there be, the if there is not a word of doubt. It's saying, you know as well as I do, there is consolation in Christ. All right. If there is consolation in Christ, as both of us know, therefore, move on into unity and harmony and love to one another. If you break down verses 1 and 2, this is what it's saying. Is there any consolation at all in Christ, congregation? Oh, yes, they said, of course there is. Is there any comfort of love in Christ? Yes, we all know that. Do we have any fellowship of the Spirit as children of God? Indeed we have. Are there any powers of mercies? Have we experienced his tender affections and compassions? They said, yes, we have. Then he said, then fulfill ye my joy. Look at those verses again. Now verse 2, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded. Being of the same love, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. He was calling them to unity. But the kind of unity he was calling them to, he gave them the ground, the foundation, the basis of that unity. You see, many, many people have a wrong notion of what unity is all about in the household of faith. Oh, they emphasize unity, of course. But their unity is based on everybody else pleasing me. When others please me, when they serve me, when they satisfy me, when they agree with me, when they praise me, when they sacrifice to meet my need, of course, we're going to be united. And Paul the Apostle said, that's wrong. That's not the basis of unity. If there is any consolation, then you get into unity. If you have got any comfort in Christ, then you get into unity. If you have any fellowship of the Spirit at all, if you have received the tender bowels of the mercies of God, fulfill my joy and be united. If I break down those things that he has said, he's telling us there are five things that contribute to the unity of the people of God. Number one is our conversion. 
the very fact that you are in Christ and I am in Christ and Christ is the center of your life as well as the center of my life and the goal and the purpose of my life and the very desire of my life and we're totally in him on that basis alone be united number two on the consolation that we have in Christ our sins are taken away and then we're redeemed by the Lord. There is consolation in the Lord because of the consolation in Christ and the things he has done for us on the basis of that as enough, be united. Number three now, because of the comfort we have in him. All our guilt is taken away and the punishment is taken away. Everything evil that will have come upon us, everything has been taken away. See the comfort you have in the Lord and the comfort you have in the Holy Ghost. On the basis of that comfort, that's enough. You'll be so grateful to the Lord. You are united with the body of Christ. Number four, on the basis of compassion. The bowels of mercies, the compassion of God upon you. He has not dealt with you like you merited. You cannot deal with the other people too like the marriage. He dealt with you on the basis of mercy. You will deal with the others on the basis of mercy. On the basis of that compassion, you are going to have um, unity with other people, children of God. Number five is a communion. The fellowship we have with the Lord. Who are we to be able to have fellowship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And if he has granted us by grace such privilege and opportunity to be in communion with him. And he calls us to be in communion with one another on the ground of that. On the basis foundation of that you will be in unity with one another. One, our conversion. Two, our consolation in Christ. Three, our comfort or his comfort for us. Four, the compassion that he has towards us. And number five, the communion that he has called us to. All these five things, they form the ground, the basis, the foundation, the reason for our submission to keep peace and harmony in God's family. In um, Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 10. Romans chapter 12. But saying, he's now telling us something we're to do ourselves. And what we're to do with other people, if we're going to keep this unity and the harmony is going to continue. In Romans chapter 12, but stand be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. He brings in another thing now. He says, look away from self if there's going to be unity. If there's going to be oneness, if there's going to be harmony, you'll be preferring one another. Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or being glory. Let nothing in your personal life be done with strife or being glory. Let nothing be done in your family life with, uh, through uh, strife or being glory. Let nothing be done in our relationship one to the other. Don't try to prove to me that you are higher than I, I am. Maybe I know that already. And I shouldn't try to prove to you that I know more than you do. Maybe you know that already. But let nothing be done in our interpersonal relationship with one another through strife of vain glory. And in the church, let nothing be done through strife of vain glory. The vain glory there is related to pride. And then in our social life, in the workplace, in the marketplace, let nothing at all be done through strife of vain glory. At no time in our lives should we resolve our problems with strife, blowing one another, boxing one another, criticizing one another and uh, fighting one another we don't solve problems like that in the household of faith let nothing for any reason at no time let nothing be done through strive of being glory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves in uh, ephesians chapter 4 ephesians chapter 4 verses 2 and 3 with all lowliness he didn't just say with lowliness. You know, you know as well as I do. If you remove the word all, if you just say with lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, 
forbearing one another in love, enduring, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That should be a good sentence if you remove the word all. And you just simply say with lowliness and meekness. But to make us understand that whatever depth of lowliness you need to get into, whatever shade, whatever size, whatever extent or scope of holding of lowliness and meekness you will need to get to to maintain unity in the body of Christ, go ahead and go as deep as you need to go. That's why the word all is included there. And it says, with all lowliness and meekness, and with long suffering for bearing one another in love and you will endeavor you will do your best you will do everything within your power to make sure that you keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace in uh, ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 it says submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of god submitting yourselves one to another you see that's the word of god and that should be the lifestyle that should be the unending unchanging unfailing uninterrupted principle by which a christian is conducting his life we're not to you know stand up erect and stand up firm and square our shoulders and look at the other pe people and say you are to bend i'm supposed to be standing i'm higher than you are you will submit i will submit and we submit one to another and this is not just talking now about the family it comes to the family in chapter in this chapter in verse 22 but he's talking about the whole church now about everyone submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of god you will do it not because uh, you know you are paying lip service superficially or you are pretending but you do it in the fear of god now can i tell you this if you have got every other quality every other characteristic and your charisma is so wonderful your knowledge is wonderful if this is the only thing missing in your life there is a part of the bible you have deliberately torn away there is a part of the bible you have taken your pen and you have said i cancel that verse i shut up inspiration on that area and you holy spirit you dare not tell me that that verse is very important for me that one i cross out i cancel out of the book that inspired that is inspired of god that one i will not do i believe every other thing i stand for every other thing only this submission bit is not what i it's what i will not agree with then you have a big question and maybe an eternal question you are going to answer when you face the almighty and it's going to bring out the bible and it will say you mutilated my bible you destroyed my word you cancelled a particular word and there was no day in your life no time in your life you were willing to get so low and bend so low and go so down so that you can keep the unity of the people of god in the bond of peace because you are not willing to submit to other people I pray that all the verses of the Bible you have cancelled. All the cancellation, you will remove it this morning in Jesus' name. And then you will be submissive one to another. Come back to Philippians chapter 2. And in verse 3 again, let nothing be done through strife of vain glory. And you know this is very different to the principle of the world. Because in the world, if you are going to get anything from the government, how do you do it? If you write an application, or if you write something in the papers, and you see that the government, they are very quiet, they will not, uh, they will not listen, there is a kind of language that the government will understand. It's the language of rioting. It's the language of demonstration. It's the language of carrying placards. It's the language of everybody coming on the street and destroying whatever they can destroy. It's the language of going to the government house and breaking some windows. Then you know they will listen. But it says you don't do that in the church. It says that in the church, let nothing. You're looking for position. Don't get it through strife. 
Let nothing. You're looking for privilege to minister. Huh? Don't do it through strife. It says, let nothing. You're looking for recognition. I am doing this. They have not recognized me. Leave it just like that. Because it says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But then now it says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And then it says, look not everyone on his own things. That's what they do in the world. They are thinking they are fighting for themselves. They say, if you don't blow your trumpet, nobody will blow it for you. If you don't demand for what belongs to you in the world in which we live today, everybody will, you know, push you aside. Therefore, they are looking for the things of themselves. And you fight for yourself. I fight for myself. We don't do that in the church. If we want to make heaven, if we want to be totally conformed unto Christ, it says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You are thinking of other people, and you love other people, and you exalt other people, and you put yourself down. Why do we do that? In all honesty, when you have genuine self-appraisal, there is something you are going to acknowledge. That other people have some strong points in their character, in their life, in the things they do where you have shortcoming. And it doesn't matter if God will open your eyes, you to be compared with any other person in the church. Even if that fellow is a new convert, even if that fellow has a position lower than yours, if we compare you, or let me say the Holy Spirit will compare you, you may be greater than that individual in about 70 things, 80 things. There will be one thing at least that the Holy Spirit can point out and it will say, although you are so and so, although you are such and such, with this person, he has this quality and you don't have the quality. And, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter if you will compare, for example, uh, somebody very high in your own country where you are coming from. Take the president of your nation, for example. Although his name is titleless president of your nation. But you see what? If you will pick some people, even secondary school teacher in that country, or you will pick a doctor in that country, or you will pick an engineer in that country, and compare him with the president of the country, Although he is president, although he has a high position, there are some things that this engineer knows that the president does not know. And there are some things that this doctor knows and this doctor can do that the president cannot do. Bring it back to the church. Whoever I am, whoever you are, when I'm compared with somebody else, when you are compared with somebody else, there is something that that person has of a good quality that I don't have and that you don't have. That's the thing that makes us humble. And you will know that I am not 100% higher than this person. I am not 100% greater than this person. That makes me then to bend and to bow and to say, you have a quality I don't have in that area. You are better in that area. That's your field. Then you do that. While I say that, you manifest the same Christian principle. Then you point to me and say, my brother, you also, you have this quality that I don't have. You do that. That makes you to do your part and for me to do my part. And there's unity in the church of God. Look at those verses again now in Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 let nothing be done through strife or vain glory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others now we're going to the next section and the next section is the supreme self emptying of Christ. And that's from verse 5 all through to verse 11. Let this might be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation, and he took upon him the form of his servant, and, and uh, was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, 
he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here we're learning about Jesus Christ, and the very first thing we learn about Jesus Christ is that he was equal in form, equal in existence, equal in eternity, equal in wisdom, equal in all things to God the Father. And the Bible makes that very, very clear in Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's talking about Christ. That is, there is nothing you'll find in the Father, you'll not find in the Son. In him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Hebrews chapter 1, I read from verse 1 for you to know that it's talking about Christ. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now, as he talks about his Son, Jesus Christ, he now tells us some things about him. Number one, whom he has appointed heir of all things that's jesus number two by whom he made the worlds he made the whole universe through christ number three who being the brightness of his glory that is christ is the brightness of the glory of the father number four and the express image of his person when we talk about Christ, it's a very express image of the personality of God the Father. Number five, upholding all things by the word of his power. That is, even the Father upholds everything in the universe by the word of the power of Christ. And then number six, when he had by himself purged our sins by himself, without the help of an angel, without the help of anyone, all by himself, he purged the sins of the whole world, of every generation, from that time until the very last soul that will get to heaven. And then number seven, he sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. As you look at Jesus Christ then, you will see that this is God manifest in the flesh. In fact, that's what we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That settles it. When you look at Christ, he came in the flesh and will beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of glory and full of grace and full of truth. It says, it's God manifest in the flesh. Now we come back to Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, we are told, Who being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. It wasn't something he was trying to grab. He was trying to steal. He was trying to take away from the Father. This was a thing that really belonged to him. He had always been like that for all eternity. But now we are told something about his self-humiliation. About his self-emptying. And about his making of himself of no reputation. Verse 7. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him voluntarily. He took upon him the form of a servant and he was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. The father didn't humble him. He humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, this is explained in one sentence in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In verse uh, 9, it says, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, in every connotation of that word, he was rich. In all the meaning of that word, he was rich. Yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty ye might be rich. You will see the way he denied himself voluntarily in Romans chapter 15. And in verse 3, 
Romans 15, verse 3. For even Christ pleased not himself. What a revelation. Even Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Even Christ, the master of angels. Even Christ, the express image of the Father. Even Christ, by whom the Father upholds everything in the universe. Even Christ, our Savior, Lord, and Redeemer. Even Christ, please not himself. As it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. In um, Hebrews chapter 2, because uh, Philippians uh, told us that he submitted himself even to the death of the cross. Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, that is, for a brief moment, during the time of his incarnation, coming to this world and putting on flesh, we are told he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of god should taste death for every man uh, please come back to philippians chapter 2 and as you look at verse 7 it says he made himself of no reputation but he took upon him the form of a servant he took upon him the form of a servant and when he appeared here on earth he served like a servant in Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, and in verse 27, for whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. I am among you as he that serveth. Here you will see the attitude of Christ. You will see the servanthood of Christ. You will see the self-emptying of Christ. The self-humiliation of Christ. He humbled himself and we're told that he said, I, I am among you as he that serveth. And he gave his life for our redemption in John chapter 10. John chapter 10 verses 17 and 18 therefore does my father love me because i laid down my life that i might take it again no man take it taketh it from me but i lay it down myself and i have power to lay it down and i have power to take it again this commandment i received of my father so you will see it is self-emptying it is self-humiliation and it is a supreme kind of self-emptying and a supreme kind of self-humiliation. And now we're told that he had been exalted. As a result of what he did, he was exalted. And now we will look at verse 9, Philippians 2, verse 9. The, Wherefore, God has highly exalted him. Not just simply exalted him, merely exalted him, ordinarily exalted him, highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Above every name in the whole universe, above every name in every generation, above every name even in heaven. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. There are people that bow voluntary to, voluntarily today. They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There are people that will bow in eternity by force. When you get to the other side of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that uh, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, why are we learning all this about Christ? That he humbled himself. That he subjected himself, submitted himself to the very death of the cross. The reason is now in verse 5. Let this might be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He had everything. He gave up everything to serve humanity, to save humanity. Let that might be in you. And you see after that uh, abasement, after that humiliation, there was a great exaltation. And the same thing also will be for us today. If we will humble ourselves, if we will submit ourselves and yield ourselves completely unto the Lord. Matthew chapter 13. From verse 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. 
But, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. He wants us to follow the example of Christ and do not and not to manifest pride in any way to anyone at any occasion for any reason. Now we go to number three, the shining saints in a crooked community. Shining saints in a crooked community. Reading from verse 12. Um, Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 wherefore my beloved my beloved as ye have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence stop there for a moment here is uh, the real quality of the Christian life and uh, now you know in the world there is too much of eye service in the world and it doesn't matter anywhere any part of the world people do more in the presence of those who are watching them than what they do in their absence you look at the world of children and the children will demonstrate more loyalty and faithfulness and obedience in the presence of higher authority whether they are parents or teachers rather than in their absence and then you look into uh, a family, uh, generally, spare those who do not fully know the Lord. And you find that uh, the men, husband, and the women, they will manifest more faithfulness in the presence of the wife or in the presence of the husband, more than they will manifest in their absence. You get into the workplace and you look at uh, the secretaries or the servants or the workers, clerks, whatever, uh, before their boss, they will do more than they will do in their absence and then people carry that into the church that generally even people in the church they will do more in the presence of their pastors in the presence of their overseers than they will do in their absence but Paul the apostle said turn it around turn that principle of the world that practice of the world turn it around that you will do more in my absence than you do in my presence look at verse 12 again it says wherefore my beloved as ye have always obeyed not as in my presence only that is who have always obeyed anytime i've been with you i will not see you deliberately contradicting the doctrines of the bible or living an unholy life in my presence now he says now much more in my absence that is what shows that you are different from the world that your loyalty in my absence your obedience in my absence your faithfulness in my absence your submission to the word and to the will of the father in my absence and your upholding the doctrine of the word in my absence will be much more than what you are doing in my presence and then it says in verse 12 work out your own salvation work out your own salvation uh, you know we are we are preachers evangelists and preachers and uh, we work out the salvation of other people how do we do that because jesus christ said whosoever sins you forgive they are forgiven whosoever sins you remit they are remitted we not that we go out saying your sin are forgiven but we preach to them we tell them of the mercy of God. We tell them of the forgiveness of the Lord. And as we're telling them in soul winning, in witnessing, in evangelizing, in the crusade, in the church, we're counseling them, we're praying for them, we're telling them the word of God, how they can be forgiven. They are being forgiven. We're working out their salvation. But then we forget ourselves. And Paul, the apostle, calls you back and he says, Come, you are working out the salvation of other people. In fact, you have sent some people to heaven already. Some of the people you preach to, and they were born again some of them have died and they're now rejoicing in heaven have you forgotten yourself are you not going to work out your own salvation what you preach to others that brought salvation to them are you preaching it to yourself so as to maintain that salvation you have what you preach to other people that are rescue them from backsliding and you are working out their salvation for them and they remain in that salvation are you preaching it to yourself so you can remain in that salvation to you it says don't be foolish 
Don't neglect your own salvation. Walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And in verse 13, for it is God which walketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I told you yesterday, there are two sides of the coin. Man's responsibility and God's sovereignty. And then in verse 14, do all things without murmurings and disputing, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the watch of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not drawn in vain, neither labored in vain. It's a mouthful. You see what the apostle is saying? He's saying, I challenge you that you'll be faithful and loyal and obedient in my absence much more than in my presence. I have challenged you, you will walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. I have challenged you, you will lean upon the almighty God who is the one that walks and wills within you. Now this is your part. Number one, do all things without murmuring and disputing. It's telling us something here. Whatever I do for God, complaining, murmuring, grumbling, people may get saved, people may be blessed, but I will not receive a reward for that. Because you see, that is not a willing service. The Lord Almighty loveth a cheerful giver. It, that's not only talking about tithes and offering. If you are going to give your talent, he loves a cheerful giver. If you are going to give your treasure, he loves a cheerful giver. If you are going to give your time, he loves a cheerful giver. But when it is you are being dragged and you are being pulled and pushed and you are murmuring and complaining, although you might even do a good job, and people get saved and eventually when you do the thing people say i've never seen a great work like this before but you did it with murmuring you did it with debate you did it disputing there will be no reward in that therefore do everything you do joyfully and cheerfully that's number one number two that she may be blameless that there will be no blame there will be nothing we can accuse you of. Your life will be holy and blameless before the Lord. Harmless sons of God. You don't harm anybody. You are not a threat to new converts. You are not a threat to any of our overseers. You are not a threat to any leader. You are harmless. And you don't write any letter that will put anybody in trouble. You are harmless. You don't do anything that will destroy anybody's marriage. You are harmless. You don't do anything that somebody will look at and say, if so and so can do that, why have I not backsliding? You are harmless. And you are the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation the country and the community in which they were living uh, was referred to as a crooked nation as a perverse nation and even though there was moral darkness in their community and and they were perverse it says they will shine as lights in the world and then it says you will hold forth the watch of life hold forth the watch of life not curse not the word of death you don't threaten anybody you don't turn christianity into a religion of uh, the people that are uh, worshiping idols that if you do anything against me you will die if you do anything if you say anything about me this will happen to you you hold forth even to your persecutors you hold forth even to your enemies you hold forth to the members of the church the word of life not the watch of death not the watch of a cause that's the very character of christ and the life of christ and then he says that i may rejoice he said if you live right if you live this kind of life i'm describing now it's only then i will be able to rejoice in the day of christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain therefore our light must shine and that's the message you know it already from matthew chapter 5 matthew chapter 5 in verse uh, 16 in matthew 5 uh, verse uh, 16 uh, let me see if you recognize the verse let your light shine before men is that it no you see if you in fact if your light is shining isn't that wonderful in fact uh, when the little children sing this little light of mine i will let it shine maybe it's okay for those little children that's not okay for you or for me it doesn't say just let your light shine just live the christian life just make sure you are not committing sin be at the periphery at the circumference make sure that you don't really you know dip yourself into immorality 
Make sure that, uh, you know, nobody can accuse you that you are still drinking with them. Let your light shine. Oh, it's more than that. Let your light so shine. Let it so shine. Let, it, let there be a kind of brilliant ray that is coming out that even blind people, they will know that the light is on. Even those who cannot see. Let your light so shine. And it says, before men. I don't say, well, I will hide my Christianity. I will live in such a way that, well, it's between me and the Lord. No, it's not like that. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That's what uh, the, the apostle also emphasized in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Walk as children of light. We must make sure there is light within us. And this light is really shining. And other people will see that. And other people will hear about it in First Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8. For from you sounded forth the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith to God's word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. You see, the Thessalonian believers, uh, Paul the Apostle, has spent just a few weeks there. And then the, uh, the, the church had been planted, and people were living according to the word of the Lord. And then they were holding forth the word of life. They were evangelizing, winning souls. And when Paul the Apostle went to other places in that region of province of Macedonia, and he was preaching to them, oh, they said, we heard that before. How did you hear that? Those people in Thessalonica, they have given us that same word. It says, that's the thing he wants for every believer. You'll be holding forth the very word of life. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, and the Lord make you to increase and to abound in love one to another toward another and toward all men even as we do towards you to the end ye may be established and uh, ye may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness you know some people say that our holiness is too much I think all the preachers have been listening to, uh, we have not been qualifying the holiness, we just say holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Here he even qualifies it. It says it's not just holiness, it says unblameable in holiness and it says before God, not just before men. You can see here the same emphasis that God has given us, you find it in the scripture. It says even our Father as the coming, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints and so you see what the lord is calling you to and what the lord is calling me to he wants us to live in obedience and he wants us to live such a life will be holding forth the word of the lord and then the apostle said there is a thing that will bring joy unto me in philippians chapter 2 reading now from verse 17 yes yea and if i be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith i joy and rejoice with you all uh, for the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me and then you are wondering now as you look at many christians around you you say is that possible can somebody really have a life like this paul the apostle said oh yes oh yes it's not only me he said he said there's somebody that i can guarantee that if you were to live with him like i have lived with him if he were to minister with you like he ministered with me you will see that the life i'm calling you to to do all things without murmuring without disputing to be blameless to be harmless to the son to be sons of god to be without rebuke and to hold for the word of life and that i will rejoice i can show you somebody that lives exactly like that verse 19 but i trust in the lord jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know of your estate, because for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all 
all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Oh yes, he says, I know some of the Christians who really are not fully seeking the Lord, leaning upon the Lord, being totally faithful and committed, all seek their own, but in verse 22, ye know the proof of this man I'm talking about. Ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel, in therefore I hope to send presently as soon as I shall see how it shall be with me but I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come to you shortly he was talking about uh, this uh, beloved child of God and uh, this uh, beloved let me call him disciple and uh, this uh, beloved fellow worker Timothy because he lived a life that even Paul the apostle was not afraid or ashamed to be able to recommend him to the Philippians but there's another man he wants to talk about and this man is really had a marvelous spirit a, a kind of life and labor that even got him to become even sick that brings us to number four now the sacrificial service of a christian companion the sacrificial service of a christian companion from verse 25 yet i supposed it necessary to send to you epaphroditus my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier and but your messenger he, and he that ministered to my wants for he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick here he was talking about Epaphroditus and you see the way he qualified him and what he called him in verse 25. He almost did not know how to, you know, talk about him. He called him his name and he said, it's my brother. And you know Paul the Apostle, he knew the whole doctrine of the family of God, how you are adopted into the family of God. He knows the people that really belong to the Lord. He is the one that had said that in a great house there are very many vessels and utensils and if anybody will purge himself uh, from all these things he'll be a servant that is a vessel that is meet for the master's use and if he called him a brother he was a real brother and then he said my companion in labor and then he said a fellow soldier and then he said your messengers and then he said he that ministered to my wants he really wanted to talk about the man then he said did you hear i'm sure you heard he was sick and in fact in verse 27 for indeed he was sick near unto death and you are wondering now how can a man like that loyal and faithful and obedient and uh, ministering to the needs of the saints and even ministering to paul the apostle how could a man like that be sick in verse 27 but god had mercy on him and on not on him only but on me also lest i should have sorrow upon sorrow i know that if he died he would have gone to heaven but then that man who was so much attached and so much uh, in fellowship and so much in the same labor that if he had died i would have got sorrow upon sorrow but then he said i send him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again ye may rejoice this is a man that carried joy the joy of the lord everywhere he went he said i'm sure that when i send this messenger of the lord to you and he gets to you anywhere he goes he's always contributing to the lives of the people there and get ready now he is coming and you are going to rejoice that I may be the less sorrowful receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation he said I'm telling you Philippians since you are my converts in the Lord I hold this man in reputation myself and I'm calling upon you that you will hold this man in reputation why Vastati? because for the work of Christ he was near unto death not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me he said did you hear that he was sick oh yes we heard he was sick wasn't that the devil no paul said wasn't that the work of a demon no paul said paul said it was because he was lost in the service of the lord and he was so lost in the service of the lord he regarded not his life he didn't care for his time he knew that he ought to sleep he ought to rest he couldn't rest he, ought, he knew that he ought to balance up everything day and night every moment he just got to the point when he was dead tired and he still kept on walking and then eventually became sick even until 
death. He said, I'm sending him back to you again because now he is well and he wants to be in the service of the Lord again. And I want to challenge you. If we can have people like that in the church, the people that are so devoted that we can easily call you brother and there will be no doubt about you and there is no bad record there is no bad report about you you are a real brother of the lord jesus christ your life is above reproach and then we say a companion in labor i mean paul the apostle just said when you look at me and you look at epaphroditus just look at us as companions i labor he labors i preach he preaches i pray he prays i minister he ministers we are companions in labor in fact we are fellow soldiers and we have not uh, disturbed ourselves with the affairs of this life the same commitment i have the same endurance i have the same hardness i can endure everything i see in myself as a good soldier of christ paul said i can see in the man and then he is even your messenger he'll bring information from you he'll bring news from you he'll come to me here and i don't see him double tongued and everything he tells me about you is always good news and what he tells you about me is always good news and you see the way is the one that ministers to my necessities are we like that can we minister like that and can other people say that we are companions let me end up by just concentrating on that word a companion because Paul the Apostle was referring to this man and he said he is a companion with me in labor he meant they share together a common will a companion they share together number two a common work number three they share together a common word number four they share together in the same warfare and so you see this man that is this epaphroditus a common will the same will the will of the father as paul was submitted to that will epaphroditus was submitted to that will and because we have that common shared will of the father upon our lives we are companions and it's a common work the thing I do is the thing that he does. There is a common work, and our hands are on the plow. And I've, and I've seen a man, uh, Paul the Apostle said, I thought I was committed. I thought I went beyond everybody else. But when I saw this man, as I tried to run faster than him, he was always by my side. And I did everything I could do again with apostolic energy, fervency, and with a real fire in my soul. And I felt I would go to a place beyond where he could reach. I found him by my side. And we're always together having this common work together we are companions in labor and it's a common word i look at the doctrine is preaching i look at the doctrine i'm preaching and we're preaching the same word and there's a common warfare the same battle in which i'm engaged in is the same battle in which he's engaged in in fact i've decided now to hold the sign and he to hold my hand because i see i cannot go beyond this man i'll take care he doesn't go beyond me to hand in hand in a common work in a common will in a common warfare we're moving on together and we're going to win the battle together in jesus name will you do that with your overseer in your state will you do that with your overseer in your region will you do that with the overseer in your nation hand in hand that your overseer will not you will not say well he is overseer let him run ahead he is overseer let him do all the work you hold the hand of your overseer i don't mean literally but spiritually and you say we are submitting to this common will we're submitting to this common work we're in the same common warfare together and we're going to be the same war together and your overseer will be able to tell about you talking to anybody whether privately or publicly that is a companion i pray you'll be a companion indeed let's rise up and pray and talk to the lord lord make me a good companion in this labor in this service we who are leaders we cannot do the work alone we need your help we need your cooperation let's have the same will let's have the same work let's speak the same word let's be engaged in the same warfare and give yourself completely to this common work he has called us to do please open your mouth and really pray